Welcome everyone. I want to, it's 2 p.m. sharp, so it's time for us to officially start uh, the Together for Peace show. And what a pleasure to have Dr. Sela Alworthy here on Together for Peace to kickstart the celebration leading uh, to International Peace Day 2020. The theme for International Peace Day encompasses the ethos of our Together for Peace community. The theme this year is Shaping Peace Together. And we look forward to sharing with you ways that we can do just that. Thank you for being part of this amazing journey for peace with us. It is important to understand that we live in a world where the most peaceful nations on earth continue to become more peaceful, while the least peaceful places continue to deteriorate. At a time where the peace inequality gap continues to grow, we have a responsibility to take action and reverse this trend. We reverse this trend by protecting human rights for all people. We must start by engaging in positive conversations to build mutual understanding while embracing the inner work involved to learn and evolve. Each time we collaborate and grow together, we actively promote peace equality. Together for Peace is a global platform for agents of change from all walks of life. We generate conversations that motivate, educate, and activate our online community to cultivate peace solutions that care. Together, we will globally fill the gap to solve peace inequality. Today, we are pleased to bridge the gap a little bit closer with the amazing Dr. Sela Alworthy. Sela is a mother, a stepmother, and a grandmother. On top of all these noble responsibilities, Sela is a powerful feminine force for global peace. Sela earned her seat at the global peace table. Her mighty heart early on refused to accept that war is the norm and her life's mission became to build a world without war. This led her to earn three nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize, as well as winning the Niamo, Ni, Wa, Niwano uh, Peace Prize. One of the stepping stones for world peace led by Sela was to establish an effective dialogue strategy between nuclear weapons policymakers worldwide and their critics with the Oxford Research Group, where she was the founder. We are all familiar with the phrase, you are who you surround yourself with. To give you a clue about who sits at her peace table, Sela was an advisor to Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Sir Richard Branson in setting up the elders, a nonprofit organization that brings together the globe's top peace leaders. Sela continued to advise the elders, which includes UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, former US President Jimmy Carter, and top leader uh, of Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, to just name a few. Sela is an ambassador to Peace Direct, a counselor for, of the World Future Council, and a patron, a patron of the Oxford Research Group. She is also an advisor to the Syria Campaign and the Institute for Economics and Peace. She co-founded Rising Women, Rising World, and FEMQ to establish the qualities of feminine intelligence to the global stage. Her TED Talk on nonviolence has been viewed by over 1.4 million people on TED on, and YouTube. Her publications contain ideas that transform peace and are acclaimed by experts in the field. Some of her publications include Pioneering the Possible, The Business Plan for Peace, and, and her latest, The Mighty Heart. Scylla is so much more than her impressive resume. Scylla is a compassionate and conscious soul who works tirelessly to create a world without war, not only for her children and grandchildren, but for all beings who walk this earth. It is my absolute honor to introduce the gorgeous from the inside out, the mighty heart, Dr. Sela Alworthy. Welcome to the show, Dr. Um, Sela. Thank you, Reem. That was over generous, that introduction. And it's wonderful to be here with Rotarians from all over the world. It's a Thank great you. honor. Thank you. It's, it's our honor too. Um, so let's jump right in um, and start our first question. Um, so why did uh, Richard, uh, Richard Branson call you? 
Sela. And for those who don't know Richard Branson, he's the founder of, the, um, of Virgin Airlines and he's the owner. He's um, um, a very famous worldwide um, entrepreneur with control of over 400 companies. Uh, so why such um, an amazing leader would pick up the phone and call you? What did he want? Um, it, I have to track back a bit because his great friend is Peter Gabriel, the songwriter. And Peter had the idea that the world was in such a bad state, this was back in 2004, um, that it needed uh, it to become a global village and a global village needs global elders. So he took the idea to his friend, Richard Branson. Branson said, oh yes, let's go and ask Nelson Mandela what he thinks as you do. If you have Virgin Airlines, you hop on a Virgin plane and go down to Cape Town. And uh, they went to see Mandela and Mandela said, great idea boys, go home and make it work. And so they came back to London and an, a year ensued what they called the washing machine process of going around like this back and forth. And it was very difficult to decide what the elders should do, who they should be, who they should represent and so forth. And after about a year, I got a phone call and said, would you like to come and help? And that was a huge um, excitement for me, a huge challenge and led to all sorts of adventures that I couldn't have imagined. But um, it, it really um, stretched me and I made a lot of mistakes um, and I learned so much from the uh, incredible people that I met and talked to doing that work. Where are the elders? There's you with uh, Desmond Tutu. You were laughing there so hard. Is he funny? He's, he's one of the funniest men I've ever met. <laughs> he's the sort of man who can walk into a room and he just looks around and he knows what each person in that room needs. And as best he can, he talks with them and finds out what they, what they would need to meet their needs. And he's, he's just extraordinary. Um, I love this uh, notion of bringing like-minded, um, like-hearted leaders who've done amazing work for our world and uh, they don't quit, you know, they continue to, that's their mission and they're doing it as a collective. Uh, and that, you know, requires what's called courageous conversations at, at so many levels um, of their work. And you've done you've done that yourself uh, when you um, utilize courageous conversations to organize the dialogue between the nuclear weapon policy makers and their critics. Uh, what is courageous conversations? If you want to tell us more about that, and what was the outcome um, of your courageous conversations with the policymakers um, of the nuclear weapons policies? Well, a courageous conversation is one where you need to take a stand on something uh, that is scary for you. You have to tell something to somebody in a superior position or somebody you're scared of that really makes you shake. And so how we make, how we attempt those conversations is really important. Um, would you like me to go into that now or should we save that for later? Whatever you feel like saying, um, Sela. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I can I can mix both because I can tell you that the um, conversation to start the Oxford Research Group started when I realized in New York in 1982 that the United Nations was not able to resolve the problem of nuclear disarmament because, as you know, that was the big, beginning of the big buildup of the Cold War. And we were in huge danger of an accidental nuclear war. And we very nearly, we were 18 minutes away from an accidental nuclear war in November, 1983. But I didn't know that. Nobody knew until later. It happened in Moscow. And, um, but I just knew that the situation we were in was terrifyingly dangerous. And I feared for my children and my stepchildren. And um, so uh, having worked at the UN for a while um, and feeling very desperate that the UN couldn't deal with this difficult problem, um, 
I was strap hanging on a tram on, in, in New York and suddenly a voice said to me, you're talking to the wrong people. You have to talk to the people who actually make the decisions on nuclear weapons. And I thought, well, who are they? And then it dawned on me, they're the physicists who design the warheads, they're the, um, the intelligence people who supply the um, rationale for having nuclear weapons. They're the people who design the, the so-called platforms, the submarines and the missiles that carry the nuclear weapons. They're the people who sign the checks. They're the people who um, do all the military um, deployment of nuclear weapons. And last of all, the politicians. And so I packed my suitcase, got on the plane, went home to Oxford and started a research group with my savings around our kitchen table. And I still have that kitchen table. It's no bigger than about a meter across. And um, I just worked with two friends who were agreed to help me. And long story short, in four years, we were able to publish our first book, which was called how nuclear weapons decisions are made. And it had diagrams of how the whole system worked in the then Soviet Union, the United States, China, Britain, and France. And people said, this is, how did you, how do you know it's impossible to know all this? We never used any classified material, but I think the, the winds of, um, of the angels were with us and we were just um, able to find out this information um, by sometimes by happenstance we got invited to China quite early on um, anyway in, in, in short it took us about um, having identified the nuclear decision makers it took us another five years to persuade them to meet their opposite numbers from other countries um, and we had to do that giving them total secrecy. It, all the meetings were below the radar, no press, no communication. That's why you never heard about what we were doing. And the press never got hold of it because that would have ruined everything. So people could come there um, almost incognito, could take off their jackets, sit around in a circle, no desks, no name tags, and just begin to talk to each other as human beings. Wow. So we did everything to make them feel at home. Wow. Um, we put um, wildflowers in little jars by their beds um, and home baked cookies for them to eat. And we had wonderful food. We got our friends who were chefs to come in and cook. And gradually, gradually, we built confidence that people could say, you know, the head of um, warhead development at Los Alamos in the States could meet his opposite number from Russia, mm -hmm. from the then Soviet Union, and actually begin to talk to each other as human beings. And they ended up uh, swapping pictures of their children and, and inviting each other to their homes. I mean, it was amazing. But it took a lot of building confidence and enabling people to talk about the truth rather than the position or the diplomatic speak, which we didn't use at all. And we did that for 21 years um, and ended up taking, I think, six delegations to China and their delegations came back to London and Oxford. We met in Geneva, we met in Moscow, we met in, um, I don't think we ever met in New York, um, but, uh, and we met in, in New Delhi as well and brought the Pakistan nuclear decision makers to meet their Indian counterparts. And that was the beginning of laying the agreements, which eventually transformed into treaties. The more and more you talk, the more I realize why you're the carrier of King Arthur's sword, uh, because it's fascinating how um, it's, it's uh, refreshing, actually, how you were seeking the truth. You did not care, like, you know, that you, you really wanted to humanize this experience and push for, uh, to get out the truth by building trust. And you didn't care about uh, the recognition. So media, you were intentionally trying to make media not there because you cared about getting to the, uh, to the change, like how we, the, the, the core of the issue. 
and and that's uh, righteousness and that's a beautiful and refreshing cella uh, and that's what earned you the nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize three times um, which makes me um, inspired to ask you about your mighty heart where what shaped your mighty heart what is the mighty heart and uh, how come you have uh, how how did it develop in you because you you have one for sure well at first I just want to say Reem that and when you were talking about qualities um, that's what attracts me to Rotarians um, because I, I started to be invited to speak at Rotarians conferences in Oxford some years ago and that's where I heard about the Peace Fellows that the Rotarians were organizing then this must have been 10 12 years ago and um, I became so impressed by the practicality of what Rotarians are doing in the area of peace that I thought, hmm, I really like that. It appealed to the common sense part of me and the um, roll up your sleeves and get the job done, um, which I like very much in Rotarians. So um, The Mighty Heart, is the subtitle of the book is called How to Transform Conflict. And, just after Christmas, uh, the end of last year, I had this premonition that something was coming at us, which would be a very, very big crisis that we'd never faced in living memory. And, um, or that we in the West had not faced. And I had no idea about the pandemic at that stage, but I realized we needed to gather all the skills we could gather to deal with and prevent and resolve conflict, whether it was between in families, in the workplace, in communities, or nationally and internationally. So I just started to sit down and write everything I knew and everything all the peace builders that I know worldwide had told me, stories, pictures, um, everything I could <clears throat> pull together and put it into one very short volume. Um, that actually came out in April and is now being changed into, I really don't like that picture on the front, by the way. <laughs> it's not <laughs> right. It sounds as though I've got a mighty heart and I haven't. My heart cracks open most of the time, but maybe a heart cracking open is a, is a good heart. But I wanted to, um, now we're making it into an online course, which will start in October. And we would love Rotarians to join in that. You can find the details on our website. But most particularly, I wanted it to reach a young audience because so many young people come to me today and say, what on earth can we do? The world is in such a mess. They're depressed. They feel very low. And so I say, well, I have three questions to ask you. And, and so I say, first of all, what breaks your heart and they tell me you know it could be injured animals it could be refugees it could be um, migrants it could be anything and um and it's what breaks your heart that gives you the energy for change because that's like a fuel and then i say okay what are your skills are you good at a crowdfunding are you good at gathering friends around you to work together are you good at leadership are you good at social media um, can you do research and they tell me and i say okay marry your skill to your passion and then you will have what will drive you forward in your life your your life's work if you like um, and i can guarantee that if you do that within a few weeks you'll have other people wanting to join you because it's very magnetic and then within a couple of years you'll probably have a fully fledged organization and uh, and so that enables young people to feel oh maybe i can do that maybe maybe my my passion could could drive me and 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 it makes people very contented to be doing what they're meant to do it's like their soul path i really believe in the soul path and um you know some of us are lucky enough to to have it very early and others need to discover it as we as we get older 
and your heart was broken at early age. Um, and for the young people who are listening, Stella is an example of what she just described. Uh, can you Stella, share with the young people watching how the, your, when your heart was broken, um, what you've done about that? And, and now we're talking to this amazing uh, Nobel Peace Prize, um, um, nom the person who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times because she just did what she just told us. So Stella, can you share with them your story? and how it all started for you? Well, I'll, I'll say something which is very personal that I don't normally talk about because it just revisited me the other day. And that was when I was 10 years old, my brother, who was my absolute idol, he, he was the one person I knew who really showed love for me. And he was killed uh, when I was 10 and he was 20 in a terrible accident. And that broke my heart. But when I was 13, I was watching a grainy old black and white TV in my parents' living room. And I saw the tanks of the Soviet Union charging into Budapest in Hungary. And they were mowing down people my age uh, or a little bit older who were putting up their hands to stop the tanks. And I rushed up stairs and started packing my suitcase and my mum came up and said what are you doing and I said I'm going to Budapest I didn't even know where Budapest was and she said what for and I said there's something so horrible happening there that I have to go now and she said don't be so silly and I burst into tears and she got it bless her she understood uh, because she had my mother had driven an ambulance when she was 16 in the First World War. So she knew what I was talking about. So she said, okay, um, but you're much too young to be in the use. You're only 13. So um, if you'll just unpack your suitcase, I'll see to it that you get trained. And she did. She sent me off when I was 16 to work in a holiday home for concentration camp survivors and I spent the summer peeling potatoes on the grass listening to the stories of people who had been in Treblinka and Auschwitz and what had happened and your heart breaks again when you hear that and then um, I found my way to work in a refugee camp because refugees were what I have always minded about most. And at that time, there were a lot of refugees coming out of Vietnam and they were being welcomed in France. And um, so, oh, you got the picture. That's great. Um, so I went to look after the refugees and really loved those kids. And um, it, was a, it was huge. Um, it was a huge... Um, a revelation to me because um, I could see that people who'd been through the horrors that these refugees had been through were now safe and what safety meant to that mother and her children and um, it was a it was a very heartening experience the conditions were very very harsh and very difficult um, but it was it was a formative experience to do that and I was I was a bit older, maybe I was 19 when I did that. Wow. Uh, so, Sela, first of all, I'm sorry about your loss of your brother. What was his name? George. George. Um, may uh, his soul rest in peace. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, that's your, is that George? No, that's my youngest brother, Edward, Edward. who's still living, I'm happy to say. And he's 18 months older than me. So I think I was about five and he was maybe seven um, in that picture. Maybe I was near six. Um, and my, the pet name that my mother called me was Monkey Doodle. I, <laughs> <laughs> I love your mom. Why did she call you that? <laughs> well, because I think I had this sort of, little bit of a grin that said do you think i can get away with this 
because uh, I was quite naughty. And, um, That's so cute. My brother, my brother was quite well behaved, so um, I, I I was the one who got up to no good. Uh, I was the youngest of a family of five, so um, I think I was probably pretty spoiled as well. Well, we love that about you because because of that you were like in the nuclear uh, policy makers, uh, nuclear weapons policy makers business. So we like that about you. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we talked about how your mighty heart, um, you know, was broken and how it became stronger and stronger as you were learning about others, people's suffering and internalizing that and working towards helping them. Um, and so one of the people that we all admire in history of a mighty heart is Nelson Mandela, which you've been around, um, um, through your work um, in, in some occasions. And I, I wonder, what did you learn from um, um, Nelson Mandela? And how would you describe to us that peace starts from the heart? How, how do you think it, it starts, the peace impact that he has on the world starts from his heart? Oh, what a great question. Well, as you know, he spent 27 years in jail, many of them in Robben Island. And when prisoners were sent to Robben Island, it was for life. They're not going to come back. And so he set about finding ways to, because the warders were very violent at first, and he he set his sights on finding ways to work with the warders instead of fighting them, which most of the prisoners wanted to do. And there are many, many stories of the amazing things that he did. But basically, by the time that he was freed in 1989, he had convinced his colleagues from Robben Island not to fight the South African regime. I lived in South Africa for 10 years, so I know how brutal that regime was. And um, what he did was to convince them that they must negotiate and negotiate peace in the country. And it, the returning emigres from the South African and the uh, ANC, African National Council, wanted to fight and they were being offered weapons by everybody. And yeah. he convinced them not to make a civil war. But um, just to go to when I was in his presence, uh, it was one, one time I remember at the very early days of the elders, and there were about 60 people gathering into a room and he walked in leaning heavily on Peter Gabriel's arm. He was 89 by then. Um, and he sat down and started talking and he's got a raspy old voice and he's not an orator. He doesn't do oratorical flourishes. Um, but when he started talking, I got goosebumps and I thought, what is this? You know, 25 minutes later, when he finished speaking, I still had goosebumps. And I thought, that's never happened before. Normally it's 30 seconds or something. And eventually, it took me ages to work it out, but it was the energy of his integrity. Mm. He, that man's integrity is so profound, honed over those 27 years of his courage and his fortitude and his survival of the cold and the brutality and not giving brutality back to brutal people um, made this um, it's more than integrity it was profound in his whole energy that this was a man you could not push around you could totally trust and who was uh, a profound source of wisdom absolutely profound every it was like a it was like a mountain that man and um everybody trusted him of course and it, it was through him that there was no civil war in south africa and we all believed that there would it, it could have killed six million people if there had been war because it would have been so devastating that makes me think about leadership and integrity i feel that um, people define leadership in many ways, but the way you're describing Nelson Mandela makes me think, and I wonder your thoughts on that, 
if integrity is um, prerequisite to leadership. Like when you said he's like a mountain, nobody can push him around. He's there to do what's right. Is that is that what we need more of? Do you think so? Absolutely, Rima. It's 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 worth every effort of any person's life, young or old, to constantly question whether that what they are doing is in integrity with their soul with their path in life um, and if it's not we have to change we have to drop it um, because we can only be profoundly at peace if we're doing what we're meant to be doing and our inner voice knows what we're meant to be doing and if we're on that path we're fine we can manage anything. We can survive anything if we are on, a, on the right path of our own integrity. And if we're not, we just make mistake after mistake. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I interrupted you. I mean, you're, I mean, you're giving me goosebumps. <laughs> and so I want, I want to, like, I'm inspired by Nelson Mandela, the way you talk about him. And the fact that he was exposed to brutal violence and was in jail for all these years. Um, can you just to, to, to make Nelson Mandela even more like for us to in, intrinsically um, integrate him into our spirit, we need to understand what violence is and how do you define violence? What, what is violence? And, and then we can reflect on more on how he probably chose a different path because violence is ugly and he seeked the truth, he seeked what's beautiful. So what is violence? Why people get involved in, in violence? Hmm. So many things. Um, uh, violence is everything right through from insult um, and mockery and humiliation right through I think humiliation is one of the biggest drivers of violence. People who've been humiliated hit back um, unless something is done. Um, but violence can be psychological, uh, emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, in all the ways that we know, um, that we've observed, that we've experienced. Um, so for everybody, violence is a different tone to it, but it's a it's a it's a it's a thud to the being. It's a thud to the heart. It's a it's a thud to the integrity. It's it's um an invasion of who we want to be when people are violent with us, and the the antidote to the 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 violence that is driven by humiliation is respect so did i tell you that story about lieutenant colonel chris hughes no but i i was about to ask you but i think it's it's time for it to arrive yes let's talk thank you well it's 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 meant so much to me i actually i've never met him but i read about it in the new yorker and then i've used this story ever since to teach people about being in the present now um, most of us haven't really looked deeply at our own fear. So that means that when we're confronted by a fearful event, we freeze or we flee or we fight. But the key thing is to be able to be sufficiently present when something frightening happens, that you can be calm, you can see what's happening and you can take the right decision. So what happened, this was in 2003, soon after the American army had invaded Iraq. And Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hughes um, in the American army was leading his men down a, a street in Najaf in 2003, when you still could lead a foot patrol. And at some, all of a sudden, out of the houses on both sides of the street came furiously angry men from the mosques, from the houses, screaming and shouting and shouting in Arabic and that these young American soldiers hadn't a clue what was going on. It was terrifying. But Chris Hughes knew that this was a potential massacre in the making. 
wow. these heavily armed young men and these furious uh, uh, Iraqi men. And so he strode into the middle of the throng, put his weapon to, towards the sand and gave his men uh, an order they had never heard before in their lives, kneel. So they wobbled to the ground in their heavy body armor and their helmets and put their weapons into the sand and slightly bowed their heads. And the whole crowd grew silent. And after about three or four minutes, everybody went home. And a massacre was averted because they, the men could have used their automatic weapons or they could have been lynched. And I thought about this for a long time. And I would love to meet Lieutenant Colonel Hughes one day because it seems to me that the presence of mind that he had in that instant let him know that what had obviously driven these men to such anger was humiliation. They had been humiliated. And he knew that the antidote to humiliation is respect. Yeah. He knew that in the instant. Imagine that. So him showing respect and his men showing respect cleared the atmosphere cleared the entire atmosphere and saved God knows how many lives. Wow. Yeah. Um, um, awesome. Uh, for anyone who knows Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hughes, uh, please connect him with Sela if you're listening. And um, our uh, respect and admiration to your actions. I think he reminds me in a way of uh, Nelson Mandela. I mean, I'm a little bit teary. I have goosebumps listening to this. Um, reminds me of Nelson Mandela qualities when you said he was a mountain. People trusted him, leadership and trust. He gave them an order. If you look at the story, gave them an order that they've never heard before. That's even not a military training. They trusted his voice. He was a leader to be trusted because he've earned their trust. And that is amazing. And that's the kind of training we need to have in. So is there any comments you would like to make about training of military um, yes. leaders? Yeah. Is there Absolutely. any thoughts on that? Yeah. Military and police. I think we're seeing this in, in America today, sadly, that the police, I think, have spent nine times as much time being trained for firearm use and riot gear than uh, communication. Um, I, I think only maybe one tenth of their time as trainees is in communication. I may be wrong, but very small amount. And that is, um, to me, that's criminal stupidity to train them like that because everybody wants to be able to trust the police and the basis of trust is communication. And uh, weapons should be an absolute last resort and force uh, for the police or, or for soldiers. They know that. And most soldiers are well trained this way. But I mean, I don't know so much about modern training, but um, we've just re recently come across the most wonderful publication produced by the armies of seven NATO nations. And it's called Understand to Prevent the military contribution to the prevention of armed conflict. And it's, it's a thick book like that. You can get it online. Um, it's called Understand to Prevent. And it, it's got um, masses of case studies of how the armies of different nations have prevented and can prevent armed conflict. So one of the pieces of work of my, my present organization, the Business Plan for Peace, is to <clears throat> persuade the defense ministries of those NATO nations to set aside budget for the prevention of conflict. Because we know soldiers are good at it, <clears throat> but what they need is equipment and training and, and the permission to put their training into action to actually get on the ground in Belarus or Ukraine or wherever it happens to be and actually prevent armed conflict escalating. Wow. 
And we hope uh, people like uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Chris Hughes would be part of designing or training, um, hopefully, uh, and people like him. So I'm going to write that down. That's a brilliant idea, Reem. Um, if I can find him, um, I will ask him to do it. I mean, if you find him, we need to have both of you probably on the show at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will find him. Uh, great. Yeah. Thank you. There's, yeah. So there's another uh, hero of, of yours and ours when we, for others, when they listen to her story, Gulali Ismail, uh, from, uh, who prevented, who used nonviolent communication and education to prevent violence. Can you share that story with us? Oh, yeah. She's, she is my hero. Um, when she was 16, she was, and she was being brought up in the northwest province of, of Pakistan, the Swat Valley, one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a woman. And she and her colleague Malala Yousafzai started getting young girls into school. And Malala, as you know, was shot in the head for doing that. And Gulilai, undeterred, she's one of the bravest people I've ever met, uh, went on to train young men and young women to go into the madrasas, the religious schools, identify those being trained for jihad, trained to be suicide bombers, and go home with them to their parents and talk through why the Holy Quran would not agree with suicide bombing. And they've so far dissuaded over 200 suicide bombers from carrying out their mission. And there you see Gulilai on the left, and then she's sitting in the middle of that group of trained young people who go into the madrasas. And, you know, this is, she, she, she's, nobody's giving her the Nobel Prize for that, but she is risking her life daily so that other people don't get killed. And that's what I admire more than anything. Yeah, she saved all these lives and the lives that could have possibly been um, impacted by uh, if they continued on the path they were on. Um, uh, probably thousands and thousands of lives have been saved through what she's done. Which uh, brings us back to your business plan for peace. You're intentional about um, creating structures and systems for peace and scaling them. Um, so you've uh, authored, um, you've put your thoughts together, done your homework, and you came up with Business Plan for Peace. And for everyone, you can get this book. It's on Amazon? Uh, certainly, you can get it on our website, which is the same name. Yeah. I think it's on Amazon, but it helps us if you buy it through us. If you can. Awesome. Yeah, please. It's a great book um, that has 25 initiatives um, that Sela's talking about. So, um, Sela, why is it important to have a business plan for peace? Why we need one? Well, um, I suddenly realized that <clears throat> uh, in the last 50 years, to my knowledge, we have understood so much more about how to prevent armed conflict from escalating that actually it's not necessary to have wars anymore. So I, I thought, well, I'll look at the 25 ways that we know of that work, cost them out and, and um, magnify that by 10 years. And that some total that it came to was $2 billion, that's all, to, to start the work of global prevention of armed conflict. Um, and so that became so popular, that idea, that um, we're now uh, undertaking four of those initiatives already underway. Um, and one of them I'll mention because it's connected with Nelson Mandela. When he came out of jail in 89, he realized, as I said, that there could be civil war in his country. So he organized what he called the National Architecture for Peace, which was to have peace councils nationally uh, in the cities, towns, villages, and even locally, where trusted people, um, people like midwives, um, 
uh, teachers, uh, sports personalities, singers, and so on, were members of the Peace Council and their job was to develop a peace plan for their area. So if something erupted that was violent and looked bad, they would have a plan and they would put it into action immediately, done by nonviolent people. And it worked so brilliantly that there were, there were some outbreaks of violence, but they were very, very quickly dealt with. So it's such a good plan, and we call it the architecture for peace, that now Kenya and Ghana have passed legislation for it. It costs only two and a half million dollars to set it up in a country, and then half a million dollars each year to retrain people on these councils. And so our ambition is to uh, install an architecture for peace in three other countries initially that would like it and then make it um, a worldwide phenomenon for fragile states to have a peace architecture. Because it's so, it's so obvious. Um, it's using trusted people, not armies. It's, um, and it works. So um, I, I really love it as, as a, as a technique of total practical nonviolence. Yeah, I know. And you're such, you're very practical, very spiritual, but practical. Um, and uh, do you think Rotarians will are suited to lead such initiatives in their communities? The oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I'm thrilled to know that there are active Rotarians in countries that might possibly like to have an architecture for peace, like perhaps Nigeria, uh, maybe um, Sierra Leone, maybe Colombia now. Uh, I, I, I think we're drawing up a list at the moment of countries um, where there could be that possibility because it's very important that people like Rotarians get involved because they're respected people in their communities and they would help um, get the legislation passed that's necessary. So it's got to be a democratic decision and then help the, the organization and the recruitment of the councils with the right people and the right training. So it's very doable. Um, and it's something we would love to collaborate with Rotarians on. Yeah, absolutely. We can follow up on that after the call. Um, our, we'll continue to brainstorm. But uh, Sela, I, I want to make sure that in your business plan for peace, you're addressing uh, different levels of interventions. So there's the international level, there's the community level, there's the interpersonal levels, and also in your Mighty Heart um, program. So Rotarians um, who are interested in smaller scale, um, you know, initiatives, um, we we want them to know that th those also are there and architectures for peace could be scaled, correct? Surely, and, and we're just starting in October uh, an online course on the Mighty Heart, mm -hmm. and it's called How to Transform Conflict. And people in that course over a period of, I think it's 10 sessions weekly, will learn the 10 skills of um, transforming conflict. We, we, we like to talk about transforming. Oh, you've got it. Wonderful. Um, so um, we would absolutely welcome your inquiry on our website. That's the business plan for peace. Um, and you'll find this section to join the Mighty Heart course. Um, or you can uh, email to me. If you, if you send an email to me, it will be forwarded to the Mighty Heart course. And we're just signing people up at the moment. And we would love to have Rotarians as part of that. Thank you, Stella. Yeah, we will make sure to please everyone listening. Our call to action is for you to join the Mighty Heart course. I had a sneak peek at the course and um, yeah, I th this is my comments. Um, and um, I want mm -hmm. to ask Stella about um, if you can share with us the example of the corporate training that you gave with the Mighty Heart uh, approach and framework and how what kind of impact it had on the operations of that company so if people know that yes violence could be macro it could be micro could be in our organizations in our families and so we need to address it at all these levels and it, it was fascinating to hear that story can you share it with us Stella? yeah surely um 
I was asked by the CEO of, um, I think it's the biggest luxury corporation in the world. And she was um, trying to start a, a program called, um, what was it called? Um, uh, active and conscious leadership, that's right. And she asked me if I would come and help her. And this was some years ago. And I realized that what a lot of very Im important and entitled corporate leaders think that they do well, but usually don't, is listen. Um, so I, on the first day, I, I had to talk to the 26 global presidents and they were all very, very chic and beautifully groomed and had their phones out and everything. And I said, um, I just want to inquire if, do you think you're a good listener? And they said, oh, of course, we're good listeners. You know, we, we <laughs> listen all the time. You know, and they were speaking in very, bien sûr, on sait très bien écouter. And I thought, great. Well, I said, let's just check. So I put them through an exercise. Uh, and after the first round, they were all kind of squirming a bit in their chairs and uncomfortable. And so I went on with it and we did it all morning. And they were absolutely gobsmacked at how difficult it was to sit opposite one of their colleagues and actually listen to them for five minutes to the extent that they could then repeat back to the colleague what they had heard and what they guessed were the emotions behind what they'd heard. And then they changed over and did it. Anyway, the long and short of it was that after three months, they called me up and they said, what you taught us about listening, which we thought we knew, um, we now apply it throughout the company. Um, and it has enabled us to resolve in 15 minutes arguments that would have taken four hours of argument and still not been resolved so wow. it's now become policy throughout the company wow. um, and that's just the first first step really in resolving conflict because there's so many other skills that people will learn on this course i, I shall teach them exactly that how to listen and how to practice it especially if for example you have a, a, a um some terrible rift in your family where people haven't been speaking to each other for years. Um, and if you can summon up the courage to say to somebody in your family with whom you disagree, would you be willing? Those are the four key words. Would you be willing to sit with me for half an hour? And for five minutes, I will ask you to talk about your, your feelings of the conflict between us and not point finger, but speak in the first person. And I will listen to you so carefully that when you've finished, I will try and feed back to you what I've heard as closely as I can, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. And then we'll change over, and I will speak for five minutes about my feelings about the conflict, and you can listen to me and then repeat back to me. And I can guarantee I don't often guarantee things, but I've seen this happen so often now that what happens is you move from the brain that says I'm right and she's wrong, which is a very righteous position, to the heart that says, oh my goodness, is that how she feels? And once you have that bridge from the heart to the heart, then you have somewhere, you have the bridge to walk over to meet. And it works. That's beautiful. And Stella, I know you're practical as well. And as you were saying the story, I'm thinking four hours of staff time dealing with something that is wasting their hours uh, instead of making business, they're um, losing the money um, of, of, uh, of their, you know, uh, the money of their time uh, in conflict. And if we look, if we scale this up, um, what is the cost of uh, militarization in the world versus investing in international development? Like if you can, like that happens at this scale, if you actually think of it at all these scales and especially the macro scale, can you give us a glimpse of, of that and, and how crazy our world is because of our choices and how can we shift that? 
Well, I, I gather that the latest figures of what we spend on militarization worldwide is $1.9 billion. It's a, I mean, it's, 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 uh, no, not $1.9 billion. Yeah, it's $1.9 trillion. That's right. It's, it's, uh, it's an unimaginable sum. It has so many knots on it. You can't even write it. So, and that is driven through for a lot of reasons. A lot of people make money out of war. Uh, a lot of people make hugely expensive weapons for war, which are fast becoming obsolete because it's all going to be fought on artificial intelligence and stuff anyway. But we are spending these obscene amounts on militarization, which could take care of starvation, take care of getting clean water to every child in the in the world it could provide um education for everybody it could enable um population resources you know enable women to have less children if they so wish and so forth throughout the world and and and, and deal with the environmental problems that we're facing with no trouble so it's it's just um idiotic completely stupid that we spend this amount of money on things that don't work. Yes. Like you don't solve poverty with weapons. No. You don't, you solve it with giving people um, the skills to, to uh, take care of their lives and their families and their communities. And that takes us back to the business plan for peace. How much, uh, you have numbers, so you, like you literally in the book list, you've numbered this. So how much money we would need to have a business plan for peace at, uh, and start those initiatives? Um, how much money would you need, Sela? Well, the, the business plan for peace is a, is a tiny organization and we need to recruit a good number of people to get the job done. So what we need at the moment is to, to really get going, we need about $2 million in the next couple of years just to get growing, get all these different initiatives uh, structured staffed and and moving um and and then it's about investment into the four different areas that we're working on and one of them interestingly is about divestment by pension funds and big financial institutions from the weapons industry in other words people taking their pension funds out of investments in weapons production that's really important. But I must pay tribute here to the Institute for Economics and Peace. That's Steve Kililea. And Steve, is, you probably know him. He's a wonderful man, and I know he works a lot with Rotary. And um, he's a great friend of mine and has been for years. And he, when he started the Institute for Economics and Peace, I said to him, could, could the Institute check my figures, please? Because I want to be sure um, that I've got the right figures and so very kindly they did and they found one tiny mistake i'm happy to say it was only one um and put it right for me so they've been really really helpful and steve is one of the greatest pioneers of peacemaking that i know yeah we've interviewed him actually on the show for people who want to listen to that interview yeah he's an amazing person he's like you Stella. you're all uh, i mean people who work for peace are my inspiration so um, yeah, and it's to me, it's uh, very, very cool to know that you work together on the figures so, because they know how particular and meticulous uh, Steve is. Uh, he's measuring peace, so <laughs> that's his job. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's, he's, he's an extraordinary man and he's unstoppable. And he yeah. always, every time I meet him, I get a kind of infusion of courage. Yeah, which I want to give an example for our audience, if you can help us with the, the story of the uh, from Congo, the ex uh, child soldier, and, and that resembles one of the initiatives that we can scale. So people really understand how peace and monetizing peace, investing in peace really brings peace. I think that example would make it really clear for our audience. Thank you. Um, you you know my our work inside out this is part of the work of peace direct which is the second organization that i started back in 2002 and um, we had heard about this 
child soldier who had escaped from the militia who captured him and made his way through the bush uh, for three days and eventually was welcomed into a center for the resolution of conflict who fed him and trained him. And now when Peace Direct sends him, say even a hundred dollars, he gets on his motorbike, he rides into the bush, he buys a herd of goats and he herds the goats to where the militia are hiding. And that in itself is taking his life in his hands because they're trigger happy, they're high on drugs and they don't like strangers, but they're hungry and he has the goats. So he trades one goat price $5 for one child and brings the children back to their families. And that puts things in perspective. When you say 1.9 trillion for weapons versus 1.9 trillion for children, what we choose every day. And I think that's the choices we need to make when we, um, who we associate with, who we invest our money with and really start thinking about these uh, things. And, and, and Sela, I wanna really thank you for bringing this to the surface. And um, being, what's what's your mom's nickname to you? Little monkey, what did she call you? Monkey do. Monkey. Monkey. Monkey do. <laughs> thank you for being that throughout your life. Uh, and uh, you are uh, our precious monkey duel too. Um, so I will, um, open it now for q and I think we have a few questions and uh, we will continue um, answering your questions and, um, and then at the end we can wrap it up with an inspirational note from Sela and Potts uh, before Thank we wrap you. this up. Well, you've made it very easy for me. It's easy to talk to you and I enjoy it. It's our, it's my honor, uh, Sela. I mean, it's what a beautiful afternoon to spend with you. And I know it's really late for you there. <laughs> <laughs> So um, this is a question from Bob Reed, uh, who also was on the show as a speaker before. He says, thank you for such a lovely session. Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi are such powerful and wonderful examples of leadership in uplifting all people. In the US, we are having a crisis of um, conscious, um, consci conscience, conscience. Uh, one in which we are deciding whether all people can genuinely participate in justice and opportunity equally, or one in which people are treated differently. Do you think a democratic society can survive if it is not inclusive of all its people? So uh, Bob is asking about inclusivity as a, me a means for um, a solid democratic society, and why do you think that is important, given the last uh, events uh, happening in the U.S.? Oh, it's it's absolutely essential, uh, and it's not just inclusivity; it's respect. Um, that people of all backgrounds, races, class, and financial means, poor just as much as rich, should be respected, and cared for when need be and that has to be the basis of a democracy the rich poor gap that is getting wider in capitalist societies with people making astronomical sums of money off the backs of people who slave all day for really very very little wages or none sometimes this can only lead to strife and um, anger and bitterness and hatred and it has to be stopped it has to go the other way and i'm stunned and heartbroken by what's happening in the in the united states seen from here um and that you know the president is even encouraging people who are maybe vigilantes or taking the law into their own hands. It's, it's, um, it's utterly tragic to see a, 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 a democracy like America um, being dismembered in this way. And I put my faith in your system that somebody 
surely can make the postal vote system work in the next election. It must be possible. <laughs> it must be possible. And that you will have a fair and, um, uh, and, and, and honest election where people can express their, 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 their preference as they should be able to. Um, and then that you will build a society that really treats not only people of all races equally, but women equally with men. Because as we saw in the pandemic, I don't know if you saw the article in Forbes magazine in April, but it, it said the eight countries at that stage, which had the best results on controlling the pandemic were all led by women. And those women did extraordinary things that other people didn't even think of. I'll give you one example. The prime minister of Norway said right at the beginning of the lockdown, I want to, I'm having a television program only for children. Yes. And I want all the children to be able to tell me what they're scared about, what they need, what it's like not to be in school, what, what troubles them. And she did it. And it was so popular that it's been copied all over the place now, I think. But it's those human things that need to be brought back into our so highly monetized society and caring and compassion and, and empathy for the situation of other people. Which is a beautiful uh, segue to a question from Senda. Uh, Collins Arsenal. Uh, thank you. Oh. Uh, she, yeah, she's uh, one of our uh, Rag of Bee champions um, and a great member of ours. Um, Senda, thank you for your question. She says, please talk about the role of women in peace building, which inspires me to ask um, added a question to that, Sen um, uh, Sela. Uh, what is uh, feminine intelligence? If you can tell us about that, answering Senda's question by framing it with feminine intelligence and why we should cultivate it. And tell us also the story of Deka Ibrahim Abdi, who no. helped win the civil war in Kenya as an example of women uh, role in peace building. Oh, Cinda, thank you for this very well-informed question because um, you know as better than I that um, it is the skills of feminine intelligence that is going to enable the human race to survive. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, think that's an exaggeration at all. I really believe that unless we bring the yin, the, the feminine back into balance with the masculine, give women and men who think in terms of feminine intelligence, because feminine intelligence is available to men just as it is to women. This is not a gender issue. It's about using the qualities of, first of all, compassion. Being able to feel, not just think, but feel into the situation of other people so that you begin to act in, in their need, in their interests. Um, interconnectedness, realizing that we are all affecting one another. So people getting rich at the expense of people who are basically still working in some kind of slavery is, is toxic to the whole system. So uh, empathy and compassion and interconnectedness are vital. And then um, the one I would add here is intuition. When I have overridden my intuition, which I've done several times with disastrous results, so it's hard to identify what is a true intuition and what is just make-believe, but the body knows. So you have to ask your body, is this real? What I intuit I should be doing or uh, what my hunch tells me. And very often it's a, it's a bodily hunch, it's a gut feel. Um, intuition is vital in feminine intelligence and we all know that. And, um, I think uh, the other one that I would always add in here is listening because um, when we're willing, as I said, to really hear the situation of another person, and if we don't understand it, say, 
could you tell me more? Can I better understand what you mean? That person will, their anger will melt if somebody else really, with whom they're in disagreement, really wants to know what they feel. And that is the bridge for um, building uh, understanding and collaboration, which are two other qualities of feminine intelligence. And I should say, it's not a gender issue. It's available just as much to men as it is to women. Deka Ibrahim Abdi uh, is one of my lifetime friends and she no longer lives, but she was the person who was called into the Serena Hotel in Nairobi when the riots broke out in 2008, the end of 2008. And there were five people sitting there. Oh, there she is. Um, two ambassadors and two generals and two others. And there was one empty seat and they said, as she walked in, they said, that's the chair for you, Decca, and you're the chair and we have to stop this violence. And one of the things they did was they found a women's organization who all had mobile phones, 60,000 of them all had mobile phones. So they sent them a text and said, please look out of your window and tell us what's happening and text us and so they put up flip charts all around the walls of the Serena Hotel bedroom and they mapped all the hot spots of the conflict which was erupting all over the all over the country and which were the cold spots where people were running to and they had more information than the government had wow. about what was happening in the country and they were able then to bring in their peace committees a bit like the architecture for peace that Decker had trained all over the country and bring them into action to deal with that local violence. And within two weeks, they were able to bring the violence under control and then Kofi Annan arrived and was able to bring about the peace agreement. And the interesting thing is that at subsequent elections, they did the same things and there was no violence whatsoever by the by the next election and the next election wow. so and it's really works this stuff it works and you reminded me when you were talking about listening and we should listen of uh, george mitchell a quote um mm -hmm. i he said i will listen for as long as it takes that's when he flew into belfast in northern ireland where we the british had been fighting with the um Irish Republican Army in Northern Ireland for 30 years and we'd achieved nothing with the violence and he came to help us with his skills Senator George Mitchell and he knew how to listen and helped build the Good Friday Agreement which stopped the violence. Wow which actually a question on the minds of our audience uh, about violence from Arthur um, he says peoples around the world learned the power of nonviolence to deal with uh, authoritarian regimes, but most Americans are conditioned by mass media into thinking violence is the way to fight for freedom. Years ago, uh, the A Force, um, a force, um, a force more powerful, it's a, a, a title, was on P PPS showing people a more powerful way. Is there a way to quickly educate tens of millions of Americans about that power so it so it, that if authoritarianism increases its grip in the no, in the november um, election people won't get trapped into responding by feeding it with violence so basically he's saying there's tension political tension in the u.s and people seem to um to lean towards violence and accusations and you said violence is not just it could be an insult it could be people not being able to sit across each other and have a dialogue in a civil dialogue and disagree with respect. So how, how would you address that if you have any thoughts or creative ideas or? Well, I, I think that, that, that book, and I don't know if it was a movie, The Force More Powerful, um, was the, it was the, America was the birthplace of the nonviolent peace force, which is a fabulous um, training for people. Uh, I think anybody can learn it, the nonviolent peace force. So you can just Google it and they know exactly how this could be organized. And there's another training that I find very good, 
Uh, it's called NVC, Nonviolent Communication. You probably know about it, but that's the one to use in families and classrooms and educate children. Children love NVC and they teach it to their parents. They get so excited about it, but it's a way of communicating in an, without violence and being able to say difficult things to each other that doesn't inflame uh, a conflict is brilliant stuff. Absolutely. So, Stella, you are uh, going to be asked a challenging question by one of our audience. It's an imaginary one. So it's uh, using your imagination, basically, to answer it. So he says, uh, Cornelia, Cornelia uh, Wiss, she says, um, if you were the president of the U.S., uh, how would you address and resolve the structural violence uh, and murder in the U.S. against persons of color, against women, ATC? So if there is a structural problem, and you are in leadership in the U.S. as the president. Uh, how would you approach that? Well, it, you'd have to take tackle it at all levels. First of all, at primary school level and secondary school level, you would need to introduce courses in nonviolent communication immediately. But then I think there's a huge amount of work to do in the prisons because you have a fast um, prison population, um, immeasurably larger amongst people of color, and uh, that punitive system is useless. It's not going to reform people. Um, however, well, it's, it, it's done. That, that whole system has to be reformed so that people who have done something, been convicted for it, don't become more violent. And, and when they eventually leave jail, uh, carry out, they, they repeat, they, they, they um, repeat offend. Um, but then, um, massive training, civic training to be organized by the mayors of every town and city uh, in civic communication. In other words, uh, teaching people how to gather together in councils when they are upset with each other or angry and learn through mediation how to resolve their conflicts without raising their voices and grabbing a weapon. And then you've got to control your gun lobby. It has to happen. Um, gun ownership is out of control in the United States. It's, um, it's, 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 it's deeply poisonous because when people feel scared, now they reach for a weapon and most of them have one. And that is, it, it's like having a, a box of matches and lighting the matches all the time. It's, it's um, horrendously dangerous. Um, and then you need leaders who are prepared to stand up for this. And I do believe that you have both male and female, but particularly upcoming young women who really know how to lead, who really know how to bring common sense and care and compassion that we were talking about earlier into the political system. And they must be encouraged and enabled to do so. Young women like you and your colleagues should be uh, heading for the White House now. And what would you, um, if we would have one message to say um, as young voices, from your experience working with young people around the world, what do you think is the common message or the underlying principle in, on which we can rally? that is civic and peaceful? Um, come to your senses, American people. Bring back the values that you know work to make a peaceful society. Act on them. Every single person in the country needs to act on the fundamental values in the American Constitution. It's a fine constitution. And you have such well-educated people who are able and I think willing to raise their voices, but for some reason they're not getting the media coverage they need, they're not getting on the airwaves, but there's so many alternatives now that are, are open, particularly to young people, who can develop vast followership, vast networks, but they've got to be mobilized to bring peace back to your country not just to amuse each other and copy hairstyles and waste time like that. 
they, they need to be mobilized because otherwise your country will shatter. It will, it will, I think it's, it will implode. It will collapse the way things are going. And that would be such a terrible tragedy. So every single person has a job to do. Every single person, black, white, whatever a creed, whatever belief system, whatever age, whatever gender has a huge, huge job to do now and not be afraid of doing it. And I, I love what you highlighted about standing up for sanity and for the values that are right in the time of social media. Sometimes, and when you said we all have responsibilities, sometimes people perpetuate uh, things that are not, doesn't make sense, the things that are like polarization. We are in a time where people are polarized. Uh, they're not even talking. Um, they associate politics with morale um, and and ideology is not like you said the heart and the mind can be on two different um, spheres and we need to recognize that um, and so I agree with you that young people because they know how to um, mobilize on social media they know these uh, platforms in and out I think young people listening uh, influencers or people w wanting to start initiatives, we have responsibility to highlight the values by which we really want to, to, to live and envision a future for peace together. So Stella, on that note, because um, I want to ask you, or maybe help us all imagine, um, I love your exercise of imagination and the future um, that we want to live in, because I want us to end on a note that is inspirational so people feel like they have a, a grasp of the future. And um, what is it, how can we imagine a future that is better? Oh, um, well, everybody will have their own imagination, but um, it, I think it's a question of um, closing our eyes, breathing slowly and deeply, and seeing the pictures of beauty that arise. Um, so the first thing would be to take care of the nature around us and work with nature. That means if you can possibly find a piece of ground and grow some vegetables, I would start there <laughs> because I think self-sufficiency is going to be very important and growing our own vegetables makes us that much healthier and stronger. Then it's the kind of um, linking up and building community where you live, saying hello to people, collecting people, particularly during the COVID crisis, helping out um, this neighborliness that has sprung up is so precious and so important. And then making sure that our schools uh, educate children for caring, not just for passing exams. Educate children for justice and caring and compassion. Um, I would like to see uh, a, a world where we cherish nature even in the cities. I would love to, I had always had an imagination uh, of a, a town like San Francisco where there's fresh water running down the side of the streets in rivulets, uh, fresh clean water that would be feeding all the apple trees that were uh, lining the road. And in this, in this season of the, of the autumn that the apple trees would be shedding their abundance everywhere for everybody to pick up. So I'm just giving you some little vignettes, but the whole point is for um, the capacity of the human heart to care for our fellows, to be allowed to spread, uh, to be welcome, to be sung about, to be painted, to be written poems about, for children to value the power of their hearts and learn the skills I would love them to learn all the skills in the mighty heart because if we could all learn those skills, 
then I think we would have no more misery and disagreement. That's me with my grandchildren. Thank you, Sal. That was much needed imagination for us to, and this is a beautiful photo of you and your children. What's their names? Uh, on the uh, right is Raina and then Pearl and then Wolf. They're so cute. Are they the same age? Like, like are they twins? Uh, uh, twins. Uh, the, the, the two next to me are twins. That's Pearl and Wolf. And then Raina is a little bit younger on the left. So cute. And so you garden with them, and that I do. I do. Raina was staying with me just the other day, and we spent hours digging up carrots and picking tomatoes, and you know, eating raspberries. And he was, he was, he's a real gardener. He loves it. Beautiful. So, um, Cinda, what is what is it the dream that you have for the world? What is the dream you wish to? have for our world if you would have one thing happen to our world what that would be is that cinda you're talking to or me for you talking for to me. you uh, Sela. yeah i'm thinking Sela, cinda. sorry Sela. sorry yeah no, no, fine I, I would love to know what cinda's dream is maybe okay. she'll email me and tell me um my dream oh my goodness um well it's 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 for um, wars to stop. If I could, if it were possible for wars to stop, I would be the happiest person in the world because war is not just a question of um, lives lost and, and destruction of buildings. Wars injure families for three generations. So the trauma that's inflicted by a war will last for at least three generations, no matter what. So we have to stop wars now before we create more chaos in the world. So that means removing weapons from unruly dictators. It means using the skills of nonviolence to resolve conflict before they escalate into war. Uh, doing all the things that we now know, and there's 25 of them listed in my book, and there are so many more that can be done. Um, it's just common sense doing that to stop the recourse to violence as a, uh, a supposed methodology to uh, deal with a conflict. War never works. War never works as a way of resolving conflict. It has to be done skillfully and wisely. And there are so many wise people waiting to do it. Thank you so much, Sela. It's, uh, it's uh, an inspiring note to end at. Today we've learned from Sela that um, leaders um, lead with integrity and trust, and nonviolence is, um, is the way to solve conflict. And we've learned that we can um, bring um, a reality that we envision that is peaceful and that we own the future that we envision. And that our world and it's the status quo, status quo as of now, uh, spending so much money on militarization is not the way forward. And that is a lost opportunity for humanity. And um, so Sela, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for just being an exemplary world leader. And it was an honor to have you on the show. Um, any last words before I wrap this up for you? Oh, Reem, you, you've just been such a great uh, questioner and interviewer and so human. Thank you. And actually, I have um, I just remembered that recently, um, a week ago, I wrote a um, much more coherent and elegant vision than the one I um, did off the top of my head. So I will send it to you. And if there's some way you can attach it to what we've done, it's only a page or two. Um, but it's it's a more coherent vision than I expressed just now. Absolutely, I, we would love to receive it and we will send it to all the uh, people who registered and we will make it also available um, next to your um, episode, which will be on our website. So people can always remember that vision of a beautiful soul and an amazing, inspiring uh, peace leader. And thank, thank you, you so much. Well, 
Rotarians have my total respect. And so I'm more than happy to have the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Anna, as well. Thank so you. now it's time to um, wrap this up and thank you all uh, for joining uh, us for another fascinating conversation with Sela on Together for Peace. Uh, and I would like to uh, highlight that with your generous and dedicated participation, Together for Peace has been a wonderful success in creating captivating conversations for peace building worldwide. Thank you for making Together for Peace realize the power of turning our living rooms into platforms for positive peace education, collaboration and action. To continue the momentum and conversation, Please fill out our survey, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share this episode with the world. Follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter to stay up to date on the latest news uh, for Together for Peace. Um, as we continue to celebrate International Peace Day's theme, Shaping Peace Together, please join us next week when we interview Jeremy Locus, an attorney, nonprofit executive, spiritual leader, and loyal advocate for the underrepresented. Next week, on the remembrance of the September 11th tragedy, we will be discussing Jeremy's experience as a relief worker on Ground Zero and reflect on what we've learned to advance peace 19 years later. Until next time, stay safe, stay well, keep your smile big and your heart open. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone, and continue to wage peace. Thank you, Rin. Thank you, Sela. Bye-bye.